Continuing our series on the work of Christ, and it would be helpful to have your Bibles open at this glorious passage in 2 Corinthians 5, one with which I'm sure we're all very familiar. Last week our theme was Christ our Redemption, and this morning we're going to look at the theme of Christ our Reconciliation, and perhaps on another occasion we will see the practical aspects of that from chapter 5 of how that reconciliation both affects our lives and our ministry as we become ambassadors for Christ. But this morning I want us to see that reconciliation is concerned with the area of relationships and to see that first and foremost our relationship with God through reconciliation is the heart of the gospel message. You'll find that the Apostle Paul takes this theme up in at least four major passages in the New Testament. He has verses in Romans 5, verses 10 to 11. Then there's that passage that we studied a few weeks ago in Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 17. There's a parallel passage to that in Colossians 1, verses 19 to 22. And of course the other passage on reconciliation is the one that we are looking at this morning. And we can see from these verses just how important Paul regarded reconciliation. If you look at verse 18, for instance, Paul refers to the proclamation of the gospel, his preaching of the word of God. He calls it the ministry of reconciliation. That's how he defines the work of preaching. In verse 19, He speaks of the gospel itself which has been entrusted to him as the word or the message of reconciliation. And then in verse 20, the substance of the appeal that Paul makes to all men in his preaching of the gospel is that they should be reconciled to God. It is this that he sees as fundamental and central in that appeal that he makes in his evangelistic work of preaching the gospel. And then in all these verses, particularly from verses 18 to 21, and as Paul sets it down in Romans 5 and verse 11, he refers to all of us who have responded in faith to the call of the gospel and to the appeal to be reconciled to God. He calls us as those who have now received the reconciliation. So you can see that this whole idea of reconciliation of putting right that relationship that exists between God and man is at the heart and pulse of the gospel and particularly here in the New Testament. The second thing I think that we can say about reconciliation is that the re-establishment of good relationships is something that all of us are very familiar with in everyday life. It's not a concept that's difficult to grasp. We've been reminded that there are many words that describe various aspects of the work of Christ. The atonement, justification, redemption, propitiation. And all these words are very rich and full of glorious truths. And yet somehow that word reconciliation is a word I think that we're more familiar with in everyday life. The root meaning of the word is to change or to exchange to exchange, for example, hostility for friendship or to change an attitude of hatred for one of love, to change a situation where there is separation to bringing back together into a fellowship. It's a word that we're very familiar with, I'm sure, within our families, at least if all our families are similar, and I suspect that they are. You know how you have an argument or perhaps you have an argument, I'm sure we never have any in our family, but perhaps you do, and uh, tempers rise, and there's a sense of alienation. You know, the air is a bit thick for a while. There's that sort of pregnant feeling that something has gone wrong, that disturbs the calm and peace of the home, and relationships are strained until the two parties that have fallen out with one another are reconciled to one one another again. They're brought back together again. I suppose the other obvious example that has been familiar to all of us is the one that's been played out for these 12 painful months on the television screens, the one that has dominated our national life. That deep estrangement that has taken place between the National Coal Board and the National Union of Mine Workers. 
an alienation that has taken place because at root there was a difference of principle between the two sides. And what we've witnessed as we've watched that estrangement is that as time has gone on, the hostility on both sides has become increasing and increasingly manifest. And the sad thing about it is that it isn't just the hostility between management and the workers, whichever way you want to put that relationship, but it becomes a hostility that develops between worker and worker. A hostility that has split loyalties, disrupted cultural patterns in the social life, and even divided public opinion right throughout the country. And what you can see is that the ramifications of this kind of alienation are far more extensive than just two figures or two sides falling out. There come tremendous splits and differences, and we've even seen families within the mining communities where sons are divided against their fathers, where traditional values have been thrown out and traditional justice has become a victim of that estrangement. Now what I wanted to say about that is that there are some glaring and obvious differences between the biblical picture of that alienation that exists between God and man, but at the same time as you look at all the social stress and chaos and division that has been caused in that minor strike, you can see parallels to the kind of alienation that sin has brought into this world because of that alienation that there is between God and man. So sin has come and worked its poisonous way through the world, through our society, and brought alienation of man from man. And the thing that is so desperately needed in the minor strike, and of course within this broader context of our relationship with God, is a reconciliation. In the minor strike, what becomes obvious is that you need reconciliation between the workers and the management. But what is also painfully obvious as we look at the aftermath of that alienation is that there's a desperate need for a reconciliation between worker and worker. Because the hatred that is worked out at that personal level, that subjective level, seems to be far more bitter as we've witnessed in these last few days on the news. I think we could sum it up by saying that to be effective True reconciliation must cover at least two areas. It first of all has to deal with the objective factors, the basic points of disagreement that produced that estrangement in the first place. And then there is the other side, the subjective side, where the hatred and the animosity and the poison that has been released into the bloodstream needs to be dealt with. And it's so often this second aspect of the emotional aftermath of estrangement that is so difficult to deal with. You know how it is when you fall out with someone. Perhaps you fall out for some very real reason. And what starts up or starts out as a disagreement on principle very often then develops until it becomes a clash of personalities. And all the discussion that takes place afterwards of the facts all that discovers is that no one really is very interested in the facts anymore. Because feelings are being worked out at the gut level. Pride has been injured. Stubbornness has emerged. Feelings have been hurt. And a kind of biochemical logic or reaction takes over. And we descend from the rational to the emotional. And it's this subjective side that seems so hard to deal with. I think God was so much aware of that. There's a beautiful picture in the book of Hosea. You know how Hosea is, is told by the Lord to, to take this woman who is an adulterous woman as an example of the relationship that exists between Israel and his people. And now Hosea is told to love this woman and to woo her and to bring her back despite her faithlessness. And how towards the end of that book of Hosea God shows that he is seeking to do that with Israel and there are some beautiful promises in the last chapter of Hosea where God is speaking to Israel and pleading with Israel to return to him return to me O Israel he says for your sins have separated yes he doesn't minimize the the reason for that estrangement but he goes out and seeks to woo and to win Israel back to him and then in verse 4 of chapter 14 he says to them look I will heal 
your apostasy. I will heal that thing that has caused the rift between us. And then he goes on to say something which I think is terribly significant. He not only promises to heal the cause of that rift that there has been between Israel and himself, but he goes on to promise that he will then love them freely. Somebody once put it this way to me and I remembered it and would pass it on to you. What is it most of all that a wife if she has committed some offence within the marriage, will feel when you try and bring the wife and the husband back together again. It may be that you're able to deal with those objective factors that have caused that estrangement. But it's so much harder to deal with the subjective feelings of the parties concerned. And even if the husband wants to be fully reconciled to his wife, the feeling in the heart of the wife is, is it possible after all that I have done and after all that he knows that I have done, is it possible that he will love me again as he loved me when we first came together? Well, God's promise through Hosea to backsliding Israel is I will love you freely I will love you as I loved you before I will be as the dew to you I will come to you every morning with refreshment God says return and I will love you freely the third thing that I wanted to say about reconciliation is that reconciliation and this in a sense is obvious, implies that there is an estrangement. But the thing that is very clear in the biblical picture is that that estrangement is not one-sided. It's a mutual estrangement. First of all, man is hostile to God, and that is written through the pages of Scripture. Colossians 1.20 says, The Father through the Son has reconciled all things to himself and made peace, through the blood of his cross and he has it says in verse 22 reconciled himself even though our condition is described in verse 21 is that we were formerly alienated and hostile to God and Paul again uses that expression in Romans 8 7 when he says that the mind that is set on the flesh is actually hostile to God it's not that we're passive in our sinfulness and unacceptable to God. But there's an active and an open hostility and an aggression towards God. And I believe that's one of the reasons why you see worked out in the plays that you see on television. People trying to shake their fist at God and make a mockery of him because there is a hostility in the heart of man towards God. But the Bible says there's another side to that picture. That is that there is a hostility on God's side towards men. Now that is not popular. And it certainly is not popular with modern theologians. Because God has been kind of reduced to a sort of indulgent Father Christmas but the Bible says, and it comes right out at the beginning of the clearest exposition that you could wish to have of the content of gospel in Romans. In Romans 1.18 it starts off by saying, The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and sinfulness in men. In Romans 5.10 Paul speaks about the love of God bringing us back to himself and he says we were reconciled to God while we were enemies. That is why we were objects of his displeasure. And Charles Hodge in his commentary says, For there is not only a wicked opposition of the sinner to God, but there is a holy opposition of God towards the sinner. And even that's not a popular idea, we shall never grasp the full riches of the doctrine of reconciliation unless we understand this vital truth that that hostility is in actual fact on both sides. The actual word reconciliation had no part in the religion of the Greeks 
because the idea of there being a relationship between God and man didn't appear really in Greek religion. So the use of that word reconciliation is a biblical concept. And the quality of personal relationship, even personal friendship that God seeks, is the significant difference of the gospel of Christ as compared with all the other religions of this world. Where else do you find this teaching that God is seeking and longing for that personal relationship with his creatures? And the hostility that has to be removed in order for there to be a reconciliation is not just sinful man's hostility towards God, but a holy God's hostility towards sinful man. For our God is a consuming fire. And he is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And yet as somebody has said, the beautiful truth is this, that God's holiness is holiness in action. It isn't a clinical, forensic, judgmental holiness, although God must and he will judge, but it is a saving holiness, full of grace, full of mercy, a holiness that has been expressed in all the beauty of the covenant promises. For while in God's holiness he must and he will judge sin, he cannot just gloss over it, otherwise he would not be holy. Yet in his steadfast love and through his covenant promises, he is the one who provides the atonement whereby that covenant relationship is preserved despite the sin of his people. And the bad news of judgment is set against the good news of God's wonderful grace. For in reconciliation, and this is the fourth point, I'm sorry I don't have my headings very well sorted out. In reconciliation, God demonstrates, verse 8 of Romans 5, his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, died for us. While in his holiness he demands uprightness in man, in his love he is the one that takes the initiative to deal with his righteous anger against sin. And in verse 19 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians it says, for in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. God in his love has provided a way whereby his righteous anger is dealt with. And he offers that reconciliation to all of us through the gospel, through the word of reconciliation, through the ministry of reconciliation. He is reconciled to us through the work of his son and he appeals to us to be reconciled to him. It's if we refuse that we will have to accept his wrath and judgment. I think you see here another great dimension of God's grace. In a dispute there are two parties, the offender and the offended, the aggressor and the one who's been injured. And sometimes it's difficult to know who is who. The initiative for reconciliation, who does that belong with? Well, I think we would probably say instinctively it's the one who has been the aggressor who ought to take the first step in reconciliation. And who is the aggressor in that hostility that has developed between God and man? Well, it's not God. And clearly from the very opening passages of Scripture, it is man. Adam in the Garden of Eden turned his heart against God and obedience to God. David, when he was aware of his sin by the Spirit of God, said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. And God says through the prophet Isaiah, It is your sins that have separated between you and your God. And so there's a sense in which one way we ought to be the ones who are seeking to make that reconciliation. And I believe that that is the basis of so much of the religions of this world. The story that we were telling to the children of Sumon, staring into the sun two hours a day with that longing in his heart to be reconciled with God. An awareness that there was a darkness in his heart and longing to have it burned out that he might feel that pure relationship with God. The animist as he seeks to placate the spirits, the animists of Taraja who have 999 different sacrifices 
in an attempt to reconcile themselves to God. Or the Thai Buddhist who will go around making all kinds of offerings or enter into the monkhood in a desire to earn merit and to be approved. Of course, we don't do that in Scotland, do we? What about Scottish do-goodism? I think I've met a lot of that since coming home. I'm actually horrified by the words that are engraved in the uh, church halls. Have you ever noticed them as you go in? The ancient order of shepherds, there's a memorial, and at the bottom it said, all's well with the man who does his best. That's a kind of theology that you have in Scotland, isn't it? Well, the Bible says all is not well with the man who does his best, for all our bests are as filthy ranks in God's sight. Unacceptable. The psalmist says no man by any means can redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for his soul, for it is costly. There is nothing that you and I can do, and God knows that there's nothing you and I can do. We stand utterly condemned under his holy law. But what the law could not do, Romans 8 verse 3, because it was weak through the flesh, God did. God took the initiative through his own son by sending him in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin to condemn sin in the flesh. And that holiness that condemns us is the holiness that saves us by taking the initiative in reconciliation, by providing the means and the basis for that reconciliation. And that's what you read at the end of chapter 5 here of 2 Corinthians. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God's hostility to man is removed. How? Because he has provided a way to stop imputing sin to man. And that way was that he imputed that sin to his own son. So that Christ, says Paul, has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Jehovah lifted up his rod. O Christ, it fell on thee. Thou wast sore stricken of thy God. There's not one stroke for me. Thy tears, thy blood, beneath it flowed. Thy bruising he left me. Our Lord has paid that full legal price by bearing our sins, by taking our punishment, by enduring that hostility of a holy God against sin. So the objective side of reconciliation, the legal grounds of that reconciliation are assured. God doesn't let us off. But he has established in his justice a forensic certainty. As Paul says, this was to show that he was just in justifying the unjust because he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. And we who were dead in sin, says Paul in Colossians, God has made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, having cancelled the bond or the bill that was written against us with all its legal demands. He met them. He set them aside. He wiped the slate clean, nailing it to his cross. And that reconciliation has a legal basis of certainty. And that is something you'll find that other religions do not have. And no matter how long that Javanese mystic stared into the sun, he could never have the assurance that God had declared him righteous. God the righteous one has made a righteous provision. And your acceptance of mine this morning is on the basis of that fulfillment of his holiness. And yet, there remains that subjective side that I spoke of earlier. The memory, 
of all those sins of the past. A fruitful field for the evil one to come along and prod us and say, Ah, yes, but uh, you don't think God could really forget, do you? In verse 19 of chapter 5 it says, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. You know that translation of 1 Corinthians 13, that beautiful chapter on love, which says love doesn't keep a score of wrongs. What did John the Baptist say Jesus had come to do? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What did the writer to the Hebrews say of our Lord's sacrifice? Christ has appeared to put away sin by the offering of himself. Now what so often happens is what happened when David came in confession and he said, Lord, my sin is ever before me. I can't forget it. It stares me in the face every time I come to pray. It's there. But God takes it away. He deals with our subjective reaction. He knows how we feel because of that alienation. And therefore he wipes out our sin. Do you remember on the Day of Atonement there were two goats, one was a sin offering, but the other had sins confessed on its head by the priest and it was led out into the wilderness never to be seen again. Two sides of that picture. The objective legal basis for our reconciliation, the finished work of Christ. And then the bearing away out of sight forever of our sins. For as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? It's the distance of infinity, isn't it? It's not as far as the north is from the south because that has limits. But east and west have no limits. In other words, your sins are beyond eternity. because of the efficacy of the reconciliation that the blood of Christ has wrought for us. I would love to spend another half hour on Isaiah 43, 25, one of my favorite verses, where God says to Israel, I am he who wipes out your transgression for my own sake. He takes the initiative to wipe out our sins and then he goes on and he says, I will not. I will not. That's my determined attitude. I will not remember your sins. What a gospel of grace is this gospel of reconciliation. There are no legal barriers between us and God. And the assurance of our acceptance is that same righteousness of God which condemns sin because it is a righteousness that saves us with absolute forensic certainty. But the other side to that is the glorious truth that there need be on our side no emotional hang-ups, no em legal barriers, no emotional hang-ups. Why? Because he's taken our sins away and he says he doesn't remember them anymore. He says that as far as the east is from the west, Beyond eternity, so far has he remember, removed those sins. That's why the blood of Jesus speaks peace. Says the writer to the Hebrews, how much more will the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience? Let us draw near, he says, in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. But we have that confidence to enter into that holy place of friendship with God by the blood of Jesus. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich and free? Let us respond to that gospel of reconciliation by singing the hymn 431 Jesus Master whose I am purchased thine alone to be by thy blood O spotless lamb shed so willingly for me let my heart 
be all thine own. Let me live to thee alone. 431. 